Welcome to the first day of EBRD's annual meeting and business forum and to the session Rising to the Climate Challenge. I'm Mariana Matsukato. I'm a professor at University College London in the United Kingdom, where I direct the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, which actually tries to bring purpose and missions at the center of how we organize policies to tackle big problems that we have, which is very much the center of today's discussion. Um, and I'm really pleased to moderate this opening panel of the EBRD annual meeting because it's a historic meeting, because the Board of Governors are about to set the bank on track to align its activities with the objectives of the Paris Agreement by the end of 2022. And, you know, as climate change is the defining issue of our time and needs changes to how we actually govern the economy, how we redesign and how we actually make governance decisions within banks, within businesses, within public institutions actually matters. And again, this is absolutely the, the focus of today's discussion. And I'm really pleased to be joined by two people who have been very much at the forefront of leading the global fight to address global warming. So John Kerry, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate uh, from the Government of the United States of America, and Franz Timmermans, the European Commission's Executive Vice President of the European Green Deal. So thank you both of you for being here, and it's a pleasure to be <coughs> on I just really want to kind of have us focus on the bottlenecks, you know, what's not going right. We know what needs to be done. There's plenty of COPSes, you know, we have COP26 this year, COP25 last year. What's actually not allowing us to move at pace? Because we know that with this particular problem, time matters. We had a 16 year old Greta Thornburg who told us, uh, what was it, two years ago, she said, when your house is on fire, you don't sit there and say, what should I do, pros and cons, you get out and you get out at pace. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the IPCC report, which told us three years ago that we had only 10 years left, we're not moving at pace. We still have, even this year with COVID-19 recovery funding, something like 56% of the funding that's actually been allocated to energy companies going to fossil fuel projects. So I'd love it if we can really focus on details. What needs to happen in terms of how we design our public policies, perhaps away from simply fixing market failures, which by definition means you will always be too little too late because you have to wait for something to fail. What does it mean to have a more kind of co-creation, co-shaping lens on public policy, but also within business? We know that, for example, the Business Roundtable last year talked about bringing <laughs> of purpose and stakeholder value at the center of how we organize companies. What does that mean for the global climate challenge? So maybe I can start with you, um, Mr. Carey, because again, you, you have absolutely been at the forefront. We know the US government is very much back at the forefront of fighting this fight. What do you think in the first instance might be required in terms of a policy change, but literally in terms of the design of our policies? You know, carbon taxes perhaps are, you know, well, they are very important, but they're not enough. What might the kind of more comprehensive policy portfolio look like if we're gonna move at the pace that Greta Thornburg told us two years ago? Well, thank you very much, Mariana. And again, I'm happy to be here with EBRD and, and congratulate the EBRD for deciding to put 50% of its investment by 2025. Uh, we have to accelerate that. I mean, the simple answer to your question is, fast enough. The fact is emissions are going up this year. There's too much business as usual still. We talk about this being an existential challenge, and we all know what existential means. But frankly, the world writ large is not behaving as if it is. And there are, you know, 55% of global GDP came out of the Biden summit committed to a 1.5 degree goal to try to achieve that and committed to uh, net zero by 2050 and to really demanding of ourselves a set of specific measures we're gonna take all together in order to achieve that. It's not enough. I mean, I don't know if Franz shares with me, I think he does that, you know, you hear a lot of people jumping up and down, oh, we're gonna be 2050 net, you know, net zero. I'm not super excited about that. I'm happy for it. But what excites me is when people sit down and say, here's what we're going to do between 2020 and 2030. And we are seeing tipping points. We're seeing the evidence coming back so much bigger, so much faster than predicted, and all of which was predicted to a certain degree. So, you know, we've got to get a kind of wartime mentality here. Let me give you a measure of that. 
we are told by scientists, experts, people who are measuring what we need to do to get the reductions necessary to achieve a 1.2 goal, 1.5 goal. Is it achievable? Yes. I'm hearing some whispers from various scientists that we may already have been locked into a course that blows by it. I don't, I don't, I hope not. We don't know yet. But the fact is that we need to accelerate every effort we're making. And there's so many things that could change in order to begin to do that. But, I, you know, you look at, uh, I said I would give you a, a measure of what we need to do. We, in order to achieve our goals that are set out publicly, we have to deploy the world's largest solar field every day for the next 10 years. Are we doing that? We're not even near. We couldn't even deploy the world's largest field in two or three months or four months at the current pace. We could organize ourselves, though, to do it. But the, the, the size of this is just huge. We have to get more money moving into the sectors. We're doing that, Franz and I and a bunch of other people are working with asset managers and working with very uh, with large banks. Six of the largest banks in America have committed over four trillion dollars the next ten years to investment in this sector. That's a beginning to try to close the finance gap, but that still doesn't do it by itself. So uh, you just can't emphasize enough the degree to which we must coordinate and accelerate our efforts. And I mentioned the 55% that's of, of GDP that is now committed to the 1.5. We still have 45% that is not. And when you ask what is one of the big hurdles here, one of the biggest hurdles here are those countries that are still resisting, that don't want to make major steps forward now, that are trying to uh, define for themselves a, a right to be able to continue to put very large amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, notwithstanding that Mother Nature doesn't measure whose it is or who got to do this for how long, but measures the total amount of CO2. And so we've got to bring those other nations into the fold here. And friends and I and others are working very hard to try to do that. Thank you. And, you know, you talked about a wartime mentality. And what's really interesting is that when we fight wars, we never hear, oh, there's not enough money. We actually activate all the different levers that, you know, government has and actually also through procurement strategies are able to crowd in and catalyze private sector activity. And one of the really interesting things that have been happening in Europe right now, and I wanted uh, uh, um, Mr. Timmermans perhaps to reflect on this, is how we've actually used the COVID-19 recovery plan in Europe to do exactly that, to foster new types of public, public relationships. So the relationship with the commission and the member states, but also new types of public-private relationships. And you'll know that the recovery fund is actually conditional on member states having a climate strategy. So you know this is very different from what we saw after the financial crisis, where the conditions attached to a European recovery were actually in different types of cuts. This time it's on different types of investments. I think it's a fantastic new moment. If you can maybe just reflect on what that means for our regional investment strategy and making it urgent like we do when we have wars. Well, first of all, let me tell you that it's so inspiring to listen to John's enthusiasm about this issue, but also his sense of urgency, which I fully, fully share. Uh, what we've done is, is set a course to climate neutrality 2050, but this course starts now, and it has intermediary goals in 2030, uh, and a goal of uh, reducing our emissions with at least 55%, um, and we've set that into law. So that's now law uh, for uh, the EU and its member states. Um, now, what, what you need to do, uh, answering your question, is you need to put a price on carbon and a premium on decarbonizing. Um, that's what we're doing. Um, and and that th the whole recovery we've been uh, organizing with the member states, where we ask at least 37% of uh, their plans should be climate related, and 100% of the plans should do no significant harm. And it's actually working. We're, we're in the discussion with the member states about this. It's working. And so um, the uh, 1800 billion euros we will be spending in the next um, uh, seven years, to a large extent, will help uh, put a premium on decarbonizing. And uh, at the same time, we have to put a price on uh, carbon. Uh, you have three instruments for that. You can tax, 
you can regulate or you can put the right market instruments into place. Now, ETS has proven a really good market instrument, um, uh, and we might be looking into expanding that, uh, certainly to shipping. It needs to be uh, expanded to shipping. We have to become stricter in aviation, and we might uh, consider introducing a, a separate uh, ETS system for housing and transport. Um, that's where you give the right uh, incentives. Now, the moving to uh, finally uh, to to banking, insurance, uh, the private sector. It is our task as as public servants to set the right conditions because public investments and public debt will not get us there. The only thing that will really get us there is is massive private investment, and we have to set the right conditions. Uh, be predictable, uh, give long term security, and make sure that the regulatory environment is is um, good for investors to sort of jump into the future. That's what we need to do now, and if we do that, I think we can succeed. And final final word. We have to use every instrument we can find. So uh, what works best should be invested in most, but anything that works to help us decarbonize should be put into place. Thank you. Um, the next question is really for both of you because you're, you're both you know, calling for change and calling for specific changes within countries um, globally. But really, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, we haven't been moving at pace. So what, is the, you know, what are some ideas that you're playing with within the you know, different networks and uh, you know, commissions and conversations that you're uh, central to globally? What are the ideas for the design change? So for example, today we're talking to the EBRD at its annual meeting. What do multilateral development banks have to do to change what they've been doing, given that we have not been moving at pace? Because if we can't get our hands dirty with these, you know, actual intra-organizational governance changes within private institutions, public institutions, and these multilateral institutions, unfortunately, we'll just keep talking about the change required, and then we don't actually have that shift. So where are the bottlenecks? What has not gone right, for example, with multilateral development banks so far? Uh, either one of you come in or, you know, feel free to use this as a reflection on any sort of institutional design change that you think. Well, no, I mean, look, I'm happy to, uh, some of the MDBs, regrettably, are still funding fossil fuel, particularly coal. There is no excuse for any financial institution in the world that wants to call itself responsible currently funding a new coal-fired plant. There just isn't. The problem is we have new coal-fired power plants coming online in a number of different countries. Uh, some of them in Asia, Vietnam has some coming on, China has some coming on, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and that's gotta stop. That's the single dirtiest fuel in the world. You couldn't fund a new coal-fired power plant in Europe or the United States or Canada or other places. We got the G7 to step up this year, and the G7 has said they will end all external funding of coal-fired plants by the end of this year. That's a major, major step, historic step. And so that has to happen. I also think that um, we need to change the model by which the MDBs have been working. It's just outmoded, it's outdated, it doesn't work for today. We've got to accelerate investments. And there's gonna to have to be some uh, amount of concessionary funding that is made available because um, a lot of the investors, I mean, they are that, they're investors and they're willing to put clients' money up for a return on that investment. But if you don't have a sufficient de-risking, it's sometimes very hard to get that first money in and to have a guarantee you can move forward. So I think, you know, that is doable, by the way. Um, but no government in the world has enough money to do what we have to do. The yeah. UN finance gap is about 2.6 to $4 trillion a year for the next 30 years. So we're closing that, obviously, with a 10-year commitment of $4 trillion. Uh, and if we accelerate consortia R&D into the critical technologies, moving much more rapidly to the deployment of green hydrogen at scale in, in uh, and obviously green, not brown, but green, will make an enormous difference. Storage, whether it's battery storage or some of the broader schemes that are being uh, experimented with, there's some very interesting high altitude water uh, conservation, which then flows downhill, moves hydro. 
It fills the gap. Uh, so you have energy security between other renewables. But there are countries today and there are businesses and entities, individual subnational states that are running surplus on renewables. Brandenburg State in Germany, for instance, provides about 100, gets 120% of its energy from renewables and they export the surplus, obviously. Now, not everybody can do that, depends on what your energy, you know, your, your base uh, possibilities are with wind or solar, hydro, geothermal, whatever. But there's much more we can do to tap into that renewable energy. There are many places getting up to 85 and 90 percent capacity today. And that's what the multilateral development banks ought to be uh, funding and exciting. Then the other thing we need to do is pull uh, the bureaucracy of countries has got to change. You can't sit around and take five and ten years. We can't. America, we can't afford to have 10 years of lawsuits and pretend we're going to deal with this issue. It's just not going to happen. In World War II, we turned out one B-24 bomber every hour from the Ford Motor Company plant. So we knew we had to do that. Now we ought to be turning out solar panels at the same kind of rate and helping to deploy them. And the multi-development banks have got to step up and help grease the skids so that this kind of investment can work. And countries have to step up. Let me give you an example. Prime Minister Modi has made the decision in India to deploy 450 gigawatts of renewable energy. We have formed a partnership with him and with India, together with a group of countries, uh, uh, you know, France, Germany, Britain, uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, Canada, to try to help them be able to do that, bringing uh, finance to the table and bringing technology to the table, but demanding from India that they've got to break the bureaucracy of, you know, you've got to be able to deploy it quickly. You've got to be able to, to have a revenue stream that supports the investment, which means actually collecting revenue from citizens who use that energy. So there are a lot of different things like this that would have enormous gain for us. And we can work together with countries to help make that happen. Thanks. I mean, both of you are talking. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Tamam. Please. Oh, I, I just wanted to, to add to what John said. You know, we, we sometimes forget how transformational this era is. It, it's usually the case when you're in the middle of a fundamental transformation, you don't see it. I lived I lived in the, in the Soviet Union when it suddenly became Russia. And, you know, it was like one day to the other. Uh, I remember when the EBRD was founded. Why was EBRD founded? Because all of a sudden there was a world where the market economy was appearing and we didn't know how to react to that and the EBRD responded to that. Um, why did the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, why were they created? Because the world had changed and the existing in institutions were not able to address the challenges of the uh, post-war world. Uh, how did the Marshall Plan come about? Because you needed to respond to something that was fundamentally different. And we're in the same sort of situation. And I would say, you know, you, Professor Matsukato, have given us uh, 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 an element to that, missions. We need missions. Uh, you know, that, that I think is a good, for instance, um, uh, decarbonizing shipping. Why can't we say we will, uh, as of 2030, we will no longer build ships that are not run by uh, hydrogen or ammonia uh, or any other decarbonized uh, uh, fuel. Uh, that's the sort of mission you need to, you need to envisage. Um, um, and that's just one small example. I could give you more. But th I think that would be the approach we need now. And that would be the approach that would also help uh, uh, development banks understand that their role is different now. And their role is, uh, is, is, is much more linked to a fundamental transformation in the middle of an industrial revolution on top of that. Mariana, can I mention one thing that Francis uh, sparked me on? Yeah. I want everyone listening to share in the good news that despite these bottlenecks, despite, I mean, we're describing the problems you've asked about them, but the fact is we are looking at the large, at the creation of the largest market in the history of the world. This will be a bigger economic transformation that is right there at our disposal, bigger than the industrial revolution. And if we will start to seize it and there are millions of jobs to be created Last year in America, the fastest growing job in our country was wind turbine technician. The third fastest growing job was solar panel installer. 
The one in between, I regret to say, was nurse practitioner because of COVID. So we, we, we see that we're getting, um, you know, with the, with, the, with the creation of these new products, whoever discovers the battery storage or the longer term storage, whoever comes through with the faster bringing to commercial scale green hydrogen, they're going to make a lot of money. There is a massive amount of money to be made because there are four and a half to five billion energy users in the world today. There are 860 million people who don't have any electricity, and we're going up to nine billion users in the next 30 years. There's never been a market like that. So I think we have uh, just a huge economic opportunity in the building out of America's grid. We don't even have a grid. We can send people to the moon. We can tell the rover to move around on Mars. We can come up with vaccines, but we cannot send an electron from California to New York in 2021. That's absurd. And so the opportunities here are really enormous if we'll grab them. So the word opportunity is so important because actually what drives business investment, which you've both said is absolutely critical. It's not just about public policy. We need and you know all sorts of uh, private sector innovation and investment is often driven by the expectations about where future opportunities lie. You can't just kind of incentivize your way out of this or just fix different market failures. And one of the really interesting things I think is how can we look at the social contract, the kind of conditions, the, the way that public and private actually interact. So coming back to the development banks in Germany recently, the KFW provided a loan to the steel industry, which globally you'll know is asking for loans, conditional on steel reducing its material content. Right, So a public loan, a recovery, a bailout, a grant, a subsidy, a guarantee can actually be made conditional on a company actually investing and innovating towards a solution. And in fact, that's what's happened in Germany. You know, There's been huge amounts of investment across repurpose, reuse, recycle technologies and steel. And it, it has become one of the most innovative steel sectors in the world. So what might it look like actually to take seriously this kind of conditionality as part of that design of public private relationships just to focus in a bit on the private side? Because you'll know that there's ESG targets. There's lots of talk about, as I mentioned in the beginning, stakeholder value. But what's going to make this again happen at pace in the way that people like Mark Carney have been arguing you know, to take it away, um, away from the peripheral, where there's interesting examples to the systemic, to the real aligned systemic change globally in the private sector. Happy for either of you to come in. Um, I think that, uh, you, let, let me be specific about steel. We make, there are people who are making green steel it does have a green premium. It costs a little more. And I think we have to come up with, I know Franz is working on this. We need to find a way to reward people for doing that and uh, to equalize the pricing ultimately uh, for, for those uh, against those who aren't doing it. You can't allow somebody to be making carbon dirty intensive steel and they undersell somebody who's trying to do the virtuous and important thing here. So we have any number of policy uh, opportunities with tax credit, with uh, even direct subsidy. I mean, there are plenty of ways to try to come at that. I don't think anybody's settled on one yet. Franz, maybe you're, I know you're exploring, and I should let Franz uh, jump in here because he's leading a charge to try to figure out how we deal with carbon leakage. Yes, we've, we've been trying to, to devise, uh, we're still working on that, and we will present uh, the results on uh, on the 14th of July. We've been trying to devise a way in which you could avoid um, carbon leakage uh, without creating a protectionist instrument, which is which which to, to many sounds like uh, swimming without getting wet. Uh, but there is a way in which you can uh, make sure that uh, through very, very targeted measures, in very, very targeted sectors, uh, you can avoid carbon leakage, which in fact, when you when you present the measures and you negotiate them, which will take some time, you actually stimulate your international partners to avoid being targeted by uh, the measure and thus adapt and change their sectors to go into the same uh, direction. So um, I, I see the carbon border adjustment mechanism also as a diplomatic tool uh, to incentivize our international partners to go into the same direction. And, and, and you, you should not, because uh, we will use the emissions trading system as a way to put a price on carbon. 
uh, our partners might use different methods. They might use regulation. They might use taxation. Uh, it doesn't matter what sort of measure you, you take. If you ta undertake measures to make sure that you aim for the same goal, which is uh, climate neutrality by 2050, then you can avoid being targeted by a carbon border adjustment mechanism. I think that's how it should work. Having said all that, it's also terribly complicated technically uh, to get it right if you want to have it in conformity with WTO rules and if you want to avoid um, uh, industrializing countries to be uh, to be affected. Uh, I, I grant everyone who says that it's complicated, but it can be done. I believe it can be done. Great. And, you know, the reason I also ask is coming back to the point you raised about emissions, which, as you'll know, I've been working very closely with the European Commission on, to my delight, it was actually turned into a policy instrument, is that when we did go to the moon, as Mr. Kerry was talking about, NASA actually cared to, again, like design the procurement contracts in a different way from how they were designed before. They changed it from cost plus to fixed price with incentives for innovation and quality improvement. And that's, in fact, what actually led to this kind of, on the one hand, top down kind of directed change, but completely bottom up in terms of the how. It was, it was left very open in terms of the how to get there, but the target was very clear, you know, getting to the moon and back and the design of procurement and the grants and so on to really foster what one could call a symbiotic partnership at speed. They had to do it within a decade. So coming back in the last five, four minutes to the kind of speed issue, you know, there's been quite a bit of critiques that G7 simply has not been actually as successful as it could have been in terms of addressing the very concrete commitments around climate. So what would we like to see at COP26? How can we make sure that we are all smiling more than we did after G7? What, like, what are the actual decisions you'd like to see made there? I'll start with uh, Mr. Kerry. Well, I think uh, France and I are, are completely in agreement. We've met and talked about this and, and uh, that is uh, COP26 needs to get a critical mass, as many countries as possible. We're now at 55%. We will climb. I know there are other countries uh, prepared to come on board uh, to have a commitment to try to keep 1.5 degrees alive, at least have the odds of doing so if we make the right choices. We have to have a plan going forward for how we're going to do that between 2020 and 2030. So the 20 biggest economies, biggest emitters of, uh, you know, of, of greenhouse gases must come together and, and make clear what their national determined contributions are going to be sufficient to live up to the Paris Agreement, which says well below two degrees and 1.5 if possible. And now we know from the IPCC, they're saying it really has to be 1.5. And countries, as I said, 55% of GDP, Japan, Canada, the US, Europe, the UK have come together representing that 55%. And we're going to try and bring others on board. If we can get a sufficient level there, um, that will be critical. Secondly, we need plans for how we're going to achieve net zero by 2050. We've got to have, you know, you can't just say we're going to have the goal. We've got to lay down some plans. Third thing we need is completing the so-called rule book by which we have agreement on the th and how we measure offsets and, and uh, the requirements of Paris. We also need uh, a finance. Finance will be an absolute critical component of this. We need more resilience and adaptation funding, but most critically, we need the, the finance that's gonna bring about the mitigation that prevents the worst consequences from taking place. And, and you can just see with what's happening around the world right now. I don't know if anybody, you know, in a commercial airplane, you can fly close enough to Greenland on a transatlantic trip that you see the rivers of melting water just racing down. I've landed on that ice sheet in, in a plane and, and we've, um, uh, I've looked down a hole and see this massive river torrentially running underneath the ice, uh, which is, it's horrifying. We've had the largest component of, a, of, the, of the West Antarctic ice sheet break off and float out to sea to melt, uh, the largest ever measured. Uh, you can run around the world, look at the heat now in places we, we just never have been seeing these heat records being broken. And, and so we're, we're on a march towards uh, permanently scarring our planet and, and making it perhaps even 
impossible to feed some people in certain places, have millions of climate refugees. I mean, you know, it doesn't take long to understand the consequences of the road we're on. And so it is imperative that we come out of Glasgow unified, moving forward with speed and seriousness of purpose, and nobody can be allowed to fudge. Yeah. Mr. Timmermans, can you also reflect on it, perhaps also reflecting on the moment, you know, this is COP26 in the year of COVID-19 or the critical year. So what are the lessons from this kind of past year on, on how to become serious about a crisis? As we've seen, you know, public money being put into the uh, recovery uh, plans. Can we actually treat this with the urgency that it needs, the global? Well, the, good, the good news is that so much finance is now being mobilized to, to recover that we have an opportunity to build back back better um but it's an opportunity uh, and we might squander it uh you know politics being politics uh, if push comes to shove and if people start to complain it's always tempting to slow down or to invest in the past rather than the future and that's a huge risk we're facing this year so the opportunity is the money is there to do the right thing the risk is that we don't do the right thing because of uh, political considerations. Uh, secondly, uh, the diplomatic challenge is much, much bigger now that we don't get to meet each other a lot. Um, diplomacy also depends on personal contacts. And as much as I like being on screen with you now, this is not the best way to negotiate, frankly. Uh, and that, that worries me a bit leading into, into Glasgow because we will have some extremely tough nuts to crack with the Chinese, with India, uh, with Russia, with Brazil, um, uh, and we need all these countries on board, uh, as we had in Paris, uh, to get the, the right agreement. And in Paris, we had the, the good luck of having people like John on the ground all the time, talking with everyone all the time, uh, uh, butting heads together when it was necessary all the time. And I'm, I hope we get the time as well leading up to Glasgow. And I'm a bit bit worried about these these virtual meetings because they're not getting us in the mood we need to be in. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I've been told our time is up and let's hope that at uh, COP26, we actually walk the talk. And with your, you know, both of your leadership, uh, I think we have a, a better chance of doing that. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Take care, Franz, I'll see you on the road. See you soon, John.